So last week I was privileged to participate in the Australian National University's election monitoring team in the Solomon Islands. The election is widely seen as a test of uh, the Solomon stability coming as the first election after the withdrawal of the military component of Ramsey last year. That study is going to produce some great data, looked at in detail at 12 electorates, but I thought I'd give some personal impressions while the uh, issue is still fresh in the minds of people. First, the good news. The process seems to have gone extremely well, at least so far. The new biometric voter system has uh, resulted in the essentially the end of double, triple and sometimes quadruple voting. While it was very expensive, it's given people real confidence in the results and the process. At the same time, voter intimidation seems to be down and my hunch is that the survey results will show election violence down too. Less encouragingly, even though most candidates including many sitting candidates, ran on a Time for Change platform. There appears to have been very little change in Solomon Islands politics as usual. The number of incumbents returned has actually increased from the usual half to over 70%. That seems to suggest that the normal money politics played an enormous part in this election. That was certainly the result in the uh, electorate that I was monitoring, and I'd expect that will come through in the data. The Political Parties Integrity Act, passed early this year, seems to have had almost no impact on voting, or at least none so far. Again, only one of the 50 candidates elected was a woman. That sort of prioritisation of local issues and vote buying is hardly surprising given the strength of the political culture and the level of poverty and the need for help in many communities. But the around six million Solomon Islands dollars given out by each sitting candidate to locals, while it does help their individual lives with roofing iron, say, or solar panels, things that can be very useful, it's not transformative to the individuals. And cumulatively, that money means that there's not enough in the budget to fix the roads, hospitals, schools, and generally take forward the Solomon Islands national project. So the question has to be, was the cost and the effort of running a successful election, or at least an election that's been successful so far, was that worth it? I'd say without a doubt, yes. Here we have to remember that it's only a decade since the Solomon Islands was coming out of a very nasty small-scale civil war, with 250 people killed thousands of people displaced, and many women and other people uh, assaulted, including sexually assaulted. Solomon Islands was a failing state on our doorstep. So while we shouldn't expect rapid transformation, it is worth holding the window, holding the democratic window open for gradual change over time. For Australia, this means two things in particular. Firstly, we need to preserve the security backstop that's currently pr provided by the Ramsey Police component. That's funded through to 2017, but even after then, I think the Solomon Islands government will need to decide with friendly governments some mechanism for providing a bit of uh, security certainty. Secondly, it means we need to help encourage economic growth and particularly jobs creation in the Solomon Islands to keep up with rapid social change, pressure on land and population growth. Doing so won't be at all easy, but there are things we can do to help, things we're already doing that we can uh, enhance, I think. That, however, is the subject for a future ASPE analysis.